Motocar shapes and forms. Mutilates and deforms might be better words. Not only our cities, but whole city regions. Indeed, it seems to be the chief architect of our cities today. The most influential of all our city planners. Of course, the motor car is it's not in itself destructive. In the beginning, the motor car brought us adventure and pleasure, drew city and countryside together, gave us freedom of personal movement, and created hundreds of thousands of new jobs. But as we became increasingly dependent on the motor car, adventure and pleasure became danger and monotony. The countryside seems ever farther away. Freedom of movement becomes compulsion to keep on moving, and the sale and rapid obsolescence of motor cars have become national economic goals in many countries. This dependence on the motor car, this concentration on one form of transportation, is not new. It began with the railroad era. At first, the railroad supplemented earlier forms of transportation, Canals, roads, rivers. This supplementary role did not last long. In a ruthless drive for expansion that often was helped by huge government subsidies, the railroad soon came to dominate transportation. The population naturally began to build up along the main lines. And again, blindly aided by governments, the railroads extended their profitable mainline traffic. As their dominance strengthened, they concentrated their services in a relatively few big centers, the railroad cities. From railroad city to railroad city, their trains sliced across the countryside and many a small town was reduced to a whistle stop as the mainliners pounded through, leaving behind only smoke. In the cities, the railroads drove to the heart. They brought with them not only the terminal and the sprawling freight and marshalling yards, but the dirt and squalor of their coal-burning locomotives. For the heart of the city, it meant the loss of building sites and open spaces, as some of its most valuable areas became wastelands of smoke and steel. Often, too, the railroad commandeered a waterfront or a once green valley, destroying the city's natural heritage. The railroad builders, perhaps, could not foresee the effect of their policies on the city and its region. But instead of profiting by their experience, the highway builders have, with magnificent fidelity, repeated some of their worst mistakes. Again, there was the single-minded concentration on one form of transport. Again, there were the government subsidies. Again, when road transportation became dominant, it tended to bypass communities it once served. But there was an added factor with the automobile. As with the railroads, there was a building up of the metropolis at the expense of small centers. But around the metropolis, the automobile, because it had more freedom of movement, scattered the fragments of the city at random over the whole countryside, flinging ever larger numbers of people into ever more distant suburban dormitories much too scattered and thinly populated to be served by any form of public transportation. These fragments can be served only by the automobile. The more the city is scattered, the more the need for the automobile. What began as freedom of movement ends as a necessity to keep on moving in ever more dull and time-wasting journeys. All this movement requires space, and no form of movement is more greedy of space 
than the private automobile. We have the naive belief that we can satisfy the demands of the automobile by building more expressways, building bigger expressways, by widening existing streets, by trimming sidewalks, and by other expensive engineering feats. We can't. There's a sort of Parkinson's law of traffic. It will always fill the space provided for it, and then demand more. And of course, the demand will never be satisfied, no matter how much money we spend and how much space we prodigally consume. Crowning the year, the motor capitals of the world stage the annual ceremonies of the auto shows. Here, triumphs of engineering and elegance are celebrated with that unmistakable and courageous attitude to good taste for which the automobile industry is justly famous. rational about motor cars. We are constantly told that what's good for General Motors or Austin or Volkswagen is good for the country. But how genuinely practical is a civilization that lavishes billions of money and man-hours on a single form of personal transportation? The motor car inflates our private ego, proclaims our social status, and provides us with the illusion of freedom and power. None of these has anything in particular to do with transportation, yet we apply these dubious values to our transportation problems more often than rational study and thought. There's no simple remedy, no quick cure for our transportation ills. We have broken down a complex system of transportation and thrown a burden on the private motor car it cannot manage efficiently and economically. You might think that the only way to improve transportation would be to design cities and regions for automobiles. But cities that have tried this, like Los Angeles, have simply discovered an expensive way to commit suicide. We must first recognize that tinkering with techniques for handling more automobiles alone is useless, however grandiose and expensive that tinkering may be. Second, we must realize that an efficient transportation system is impossible without wise regional and city planning policies. The Netherlands is the world's most intensively developed country. Every square foot of land, much of it reclaimed from the sea, must serve the nation efficiently. And so the Netherlands has long practiced wise land planning and equally, indeed inseparably, wise transportation planning. 
Waterways, naturally, were the heart of the transportation system in a land that is laced with rivers and canals. But when the railroad era began in the Netherlands, the railways supplemented, not supplanted, the waterways. Motor transport, when it came in turn, supplemented, not supplanted, the railroads. Each form of transport does the job for which it is best suited, and all flourish side by side in a balanced and efficient network. Even the individual parts of the transportation network are balanced. Freight trains handle garden produce going to distant markets or bulk cargoes to areas not served by canals. The fine international trains that link the cities of Europe with those of the Netherlands are often routed around the cities through rings of suburban stations. Fast, frequent, cheap and pleasant commuter service between cities puts the private motor car at a disadvantage, even for short trips. Within the cities, the motor car has made inroads. But the cities generally are so compact and so well served by good public transit that they have not yet been fragmented by the automobile. The ports of the Netherlands are the busiest in Europe. And one of the main reasons is that people and goods have a wide choice of ways by which to continue their journeys. In the Netherlands transportation system, the old is not dominated by the new. The best of the old is combined with the best of the new. the Netherlands, small and densely populated, lends itself well to such a system. But the universal lesson is that as a nation becomes more complex and heavily populated, the use of land must be ever more intelligently planned, and the transportation system must become more varied, balanced, and rational. With time, with careful study, above all with wise planning rather than haphazard bulldozing, we may be able to solve the problems of restoring efficiency and balance to our national and regional transportation networks. But in the hearts of our cities, there is no time left. In all industrialized nations, the automobile is destroying not only the traditional values of the city, but its ability to function as it should. The chief purpose of the city is meeting, the bringing together of people and goods, and transportation is essential to that purpose. When Paris 
was a relatively compact city, a central market like Les Halles, where people and goods met, was convenient, efficient, and pleasant. But the overgrowth of Paris, which created its own congestion, also turned the single central market into a nightmare of congestion. The chaos of Les Halles strained the transportation system of the whole center of Paris and increased food prices in the whole region of Paris. No costly new roads or other devices to handle traffic can solve this problem. Paris plans to move most of Les Halles to the outskirts of the city. Clots of congestion like Les Halles are growing in all our cities in several forms. The most common are caused by the marriage of the automobile, which can draw people from a vast area around the city, to the elevator, which can heap them up in high buildings. A big office building draws as many people in a day as a big football game. Most of them arrive and leave at about the same time. And if many of them use private automobiles, the result in the streets around is, predictably, chaos. As these clots of congestion multiply and spread, so does the congestion of people, and so do the problems of moving them by private automobile. The result is, predictably, citywide chaos. Clogged city arteries caused by building too densely and relying too much on the private automobile for city transportation is not only a North American disease. It is spreading rapidly to the old cities of Europe, even less suited to the use of the motor car. Public transportation systems are everywhere suffering as the automobile takes over more and more of the hearts of the cities. We are exchanging the meaningful and varied life of the city for an increasingly monotonous life on wheels. In the process, we are destroying the beauty of the city. The splendors of the city are obliterated and its vitality is strangled. To what purpose? Automobiles and people 
compete for vanishing space. It is a struggle in which all are losers, cities, people, and automobiles. act of making the heart of the city accessible, the planners of congestion have already almost made it uninhabitable. Selling our urban birthright for a sorry mess of motor cars. We have forgotten that cities are built to foster human contact and interchange. When transportation takes over the precious central space needed for meeting and mixing, it serves no good purpose, not even its own. If we are to save the hearts of our cities, the choice is clear and urgent. Does the city exist for people or for motor cars? There is only one practical answer. We must boldly control the use of the motor car in the dense cores of our cities, possibly, in the end, outlawing it in busy periods for all but essential uses. The heart of the city should be served chiefly by rapid transit, buses, taxis, and above all, the human foot. Vigilant control of the use of the private automobile in the center of the city is inevitable. We should control it now before we complete the destruction of our cities in a vain attempt to accommodate the motor car.
And still, in the sleeping cities, the insidious infiltration goes on.